right. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, I, I, several of you here, I realize, have ha heard a version of this talk before, uh, despite the result being like s seven months old only. I guess we all go to the same conferences. Um, but uh, Maxime and I, so I'm, I'm going to talk about new joint work with, with Maxime Wolf. And we decided we would take the opportunity here, the, the fact that we're giving two talks to an audience who we hope will be very interested, um, to use both talks to sort of give more details of the proof, explain something that maybe you can take home and use to do other stuff with. So um, I have the pleasure today of giving kind of more sort of surrounding motivation and ideas and tools than I usually would in such a talk. Um, and Maxime tomorrow will uh, try and get into a, a piece of uh, more detail, I think. Um, so that said, also having more time and flexibility, your questions are extra welcome today. Um, so ask away. Okay, so what are we interested in? I, I want to understand just rigidity of group actions. So the very, let's start from a very broad setting and narrow down. Um, I want to understand uh, representations of a discrete group. So gamma is some discrete group. I should write bigger, excuse me. So here's our setup. I have gamma, some discrete group, think finitely generated. And I have G, some topological group. And I want to understand representations of gamma into G um, and how flexible and rigid they are. So the context that you may be used to is uh, the case where G is a Lie group or a linear group, and this is classical representation theory. Or for dynamicists, G is maybe a group of homeomorphisms of some manifold, or diffeomorphisms of manifold if you're doing smooth dynamics. Uh, and this is giving you, you know, possible group actions on the manifold. Okay. Um, and uh, there's lots of ways that you can say how flexible or rigid these are. I'm going to take a strong definition of rigidity. So definition, uh, provisionary definition. So uh, we might have to come back and adjust. Uh, a representation um, of this sort is rigid if uh, well, so I want to say that all deformations of this, even on a global scale, all deformations are just trivial. Uh, so what, what do I mean by trivial? How about attained by conjugation in G? That's always something you can do. Um, so uh, to say that this is trivial means that uh, if I take the space of all representations, um, gamma G, um, I want a quotient by the conjugation action of G. Okay. So um, to say that the only deformations in here just came from this, which I've now killed, should be saying uh, if uh, rho inside of this space, uh, when I pass to the quotient, is an isolated point. a very strong notion, but I will give you some examples in a minute of where this actually occurs. Okay. Um, however, there's a bit of a problem. I just sort of very brazenly took a quotient to be like, I don't care about conjugacy, and what I've come up with is probably a very terrible space. Okay, so uh, issue Even in the nicest qua uh, cases, this quotient is typically very highly disgusting, like non Hausdorff, say. Uh, let's do an easy example. 
Uh, how about gamma? It's just it's just a cyclic group, uh, and G is classical example SL2C. Okay, it's a familiar space to many people in this room. So now this space really is just uh, homomorphisms of Z into SL2C. So that's just SL2C uh, up to conjugation in SL2C. And uh, so I'm just talking about conjugacy classes here. That's not very sophisticated. But already there's an issue, right? Uh, here's a conjugacy class, things that are upper triangular, where t is not 0. Okay. Uh, and here's a different conjugacy class. These are not conjugate, uh, but I cannot separate them by open sets. Right? Up in SL2C, before I quotient, I can take t as close to 0 as I want. Okay. And you can imagine that if I put in some more complicated group, this only gets worse. OK, so um, I don't like non-Hausdorff spaces, because I don't know how to put coordinates on them and things like that, because you know, put coordinates in R or something. So uh, let's uh, fix this and take a bigger quotient. Um, uh, so that line means something to some people. So, um, uh, but I won't put it there. That's meaningless. OK, so here's the fix. Is um, define uh, a character space x gamma g to be just abstractly the largest Hausdorff quotient. of um, gamma g mod g by conjugation. This is a thing you can do using uh, uh, undergraduate topology. Any topological space has a uh, largest Hausdorff quotient with the property that a map to another Hausdorff space factors through this one. Great. Um, and so now this is the thing that you could possibly hope to work with. And we'll go back to our definition and fix it up a little bit and just um, Take this out and put this in. And now I'm saying that there's um, no, all the deformations are just by conjugacy uh, as far as you could ever hope to measure in any kind of reasonable way. OK. OK, so that maybe sounded like a bunch of setup and abstract nonsense, but uh, this is a thing that people work with all the time. So for an example, in SL2C, in the case where your group uh, really is this, uh, this is just, or I should say four, uh, this is the character variety. So it's better than being Hausdorff, it actually has the structure of an affine variety. So there's all kinds of algebraic structure. And uh, this actually is true for SLNC representations. And you know, for a larger class of Lie groups, it's the quotient you get from geometric invariant theory. Um, and the example that we're interested in, so I'll edit this to SLNC so you think it's very good. So it's just captured as parameterized by characters of representations. It's as nice as you could hope for. Okay. Uh, what I like is dynamics of group actions, and there's one other th context in which this is beautiful and it makes sense. Uh, and this was perhaps sort of known or understood, um, but Maxime and I had to write down the details because it, it hadn't been done. So, proposition. Um, if your group is the group of homeomorphisms, of I can't do any manifold, that would be an interesting question. But let's take a nice one manifold. Let's take the circle. Orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle. Uh, gamma anything, so any discrete group. Okay. Uh, this thing that I presented is just a, as some weird abstract quotient of things up to conjugation insofar as you can understand them. Uh, this has a nice interpretation this analog of the character variety is representations up t 
to semi-conjugacy. Okay. okay. So if you haven't seen thought of semi-conjugacy in this context before, probably this goes without saying, but just in case, worth doing quickly. Um, if I have, uh, so conjugacy means there's some homeomorphism of the circle, so that H composed with rho of gamma, is, maybe I have rho one and rho two and they're conjugate, um, is the same thing as rho two of gamma composed with H for all gamma. Gamma, that's conjugate. If H is a homeomorphism, semi-conjugate, uh, means that I don't require H to be a homomorphism. Just take H from the circle to the circle to be, uh, sorry, should not use my fingers, um, continuous. So I'm going to let you collapse intervals down to points. So continuous and degree one, and I want you to weakly preserve cyclic order. Okay, so you can collapse intervals to points, but you can't go back and forth and screw things up too badly. Okay, so um, this is an example of two representations being semi-conjugate. So it's like conjugate, but slightly weaker. And I'll say that semi-conjugacy is the equivalence relation generated by uh, this. So um, uh, I'll say that in this case, so if this happens, for some h, say rho 1 is equivalent to rho 2, and semi-conjugacy is the equivalence relation this generates. Okay. So as I've stated it, it wasn't symmetric, um, but Really, the symmetric version of this is you have two actions, and if you can kind of collapse a wandering interval in one, and maybe blow up some points also to get the other, uh, blow up an orbit or collapse one back, collapse a wandering interval down, um, that's that's all you need to do to pass within a semi-conjugacy class. Okay. So it's pretty easy to check that semi-conjugacy classes. Um, are connected and they're the closure of conjugacy classes. And so that's how you start to recover this. Okay, but to say that this is exactly the largest Hausdorff quotient on the nose um, is a little bit more work. Okay. But this is a natural notion and it's been studied for a long time. Um, uh, uh, it turns out nicely though that it just fits into this context. Okay, great, okay, so uh, this is what I'm interested in, rigidity and flexibility of actions. Here's a familiar context. Here's a kind of a nice way to talk about this in the group action setting. Uh, how about some examples of things that are actually rigid? Okay. So probably the most famous example of rigidity, um, I want to keep up that definition there, so let me start again. Yeah. All right, so example, where does this come from? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, uh, on the basic point, you have the example of the two matrices, the identity of the E1. Yeah. That you cannot separate the Santa Claus space. How does it begin when you have this extension? What happened? How does... No, whatever, you have this quotient, yeah. and it was, you have the trouble that the identity you will separate from the So it's not quotient, so I should, yeah, I so should so identify these two points. You have to, well, okay, so when you have this extension, what happened to those two guys? What, when I have this, this further quotient, or...? Yeah, so you have yeah. the largest count or... Yeah, 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 so if I'm really taking uh, just SL2C, uh -huh. So HOM the SL2C mod this, and I take the largest Hausdorff quotient. That is all I identify. I, now I'm just, yeah, 
traces, okay. it's, it's now the space of traces of matrices. Ah, so X, okay. yeah, Z, S, L, 2, C is in natural correspondence by a trace with C. Okay. Yeah, so this is exactly what, and so more generally, if I had some other group, I should now recover traces of all the elements. Uh, if I have SLNC, I should look at characters. And, and I mean, this is, you can prove that is exactly what happens. These, this is the largest Hausdorff quotient. Yeah. Cool. So one of the points of this talk is I've, I'm kind of cooking this to try and draw parallels between the, the linear representations case and the groups acting on the circle case, okay, which is um, you know, a theme that I've been motivated by for a long time is that uh, like dynamics of group actions with no regularity should, uh, you know, a priori not be anything like linear representation theory. But if you look very hard and you do a lot of work, there are these surprising parallels that come up. Um, and that's the, the whole point of this talk today. Okay, so let's draw another parallel. Let me do an example of rigidity in this Lie groups case. How about the, my favorite theorem since a long time? Uh, uh, many of you will say this is Mostow rigidity, but the form I'm gonna state it, I think, is older and just due to Calabi. Okay. It says the following, if my gamma is the fundamental group of a hyperbolic manifold, of dimension at least three. So in other words, I can think of gamma inside of uh, SON1, the group of isometries of hyperbolic space, as something that where the quotient is compact and that will recover, uh, um, I guess, the unit tangent bundle of my manifold. So this is co-compact lattice. Okay. So, i.e., mm -hmm. uh, then I just told you that gamma sits inside this Lie group. Uh, this natural inclusion of gamma into SON1, this geometric one that comes here, um, is rigid in the sense that it's an isolated point in this character space. Okay. So that's kind of the geometric version or the, the linear groups version and kind of the, the paradigm for all of this. Mm. Uh, what might the nonlinear i.e. groups acting on manifolds version B. Okay. So if I want to recover this, I want to substitute candidate for a theorem. I want to substitute for being, you know, a co-compact lattice in a Lie group. Okay. Well, um, here's the best substitute uh, definition. Let's call uh, representation of gamma into a group of homeomorphisms of M geometric. Now, here, this is not a Lie group. It's not finite dimensional in any kind of way. It's not even locally compact. This is a disaster. How am I going to try and recover something like this? I'll just artificially insist that there's a Lie group in there. So it's geometric uh, if it factors through an inclusion of gamma into some Lie group as a co-compact lattice. Okay, so like uh, uh, this example here. And then I want G to act on M in a natural way. So G, 
uh, I'm going to require to be a connected Lie group. And I want it to act on the mani manifold transitively. So that I don't, I see all of M. Okay, in other words, M should be a homogeneous space for G. Okay. okay. That's the definition. Uh, gamma sits in the axon M in a way that sees a lot of geometry. Okay. It's a co-compact lattice and a group that makes this a homogeneous space. Okay. Uh, maybe the example zero of this is uh, you can put the fundamental group of a surface of genus G, at least two. Okay, it's one dimension down from uh, the Calabi's theorem over there into PSL2R or SL21, if you like that notation better, uh, which acts on the circle by homeomorphisms. Where this action is by Mobius transformations, if you like, or if you think of this as the isometries of hyperbolic space, and you take the Poincaré disk model, this is the action on the boundary. Okay. All right. So uh, this composition, if I call this rho, that's an action of a surface group on the circle, which is geometric because I cooked it up that way. I put this inside of here, uh, put, a, put a hyperbolic structure on the surface, if you like. It now, its fundamental group is acting on the universal cover, the hyperbolic plane by isometries, in a way that this is a lattice in this group. And this acts nicely on the circle. Okay. I like this example particularly much um, because you might have run across it without this space in the middle. Um, this is the sense, this is, a, this is a, a hyperbolic group in the sense of Gromov, and this is really the action on the Gromov boundary of the group, which is by homeomorphisms. There's no extra structure there. If you're doing geometric group theory, this is all you've got. Um, and oh, nice. What a nice example of something that satisfies the definition of geometric. See, secretly, there's a Lie group inside there. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Um, great. So we have a definition. What's the theorem that goes along with it? Uh, uh, an older theorem. Uh, uh, due to Matsumoto, uh, from I guess it's about 30 years old. Now it's from 1990. Okay, it's uh, the remarkable statement that example zero is rigid. I.e. Okay. Uh, if you take this representation, it is an isolated point in the character space for actions of the fundamental group on a surface on the circle. In other words, any deformation, even globally, is semi-conjugate, dynamically essentially the same, to the original action you started with. Um, at the time, I don't think anyone thought that uh, one would ever have sort of a Mostow rigidity-ish theorem for uh, things with no regularity and no group structure or anything in the target. Um, uh, this is the part in the talk where I have to tell everyone who studies surface groups in PSL2R and likes Teichmuller space, which is the space of all representations here up to conjugacy, and it's large, and it's interesting, and it's rich, that I had just killed it entirely because uh, all of these examples, where you go into PSL2R first, are conjugate in the group of homeomorphisms of the circle. Okay. So although when you quotient by PSL2R, you get something 
big and interesting if I take the quotient by dynamicist, you know, topological dynamics, if I care about things up to topological conjugacy, that's now done. Okay, so this is not a contradiction in mathematics. This theorem makes sense. This, this example is one example, and it is an isolated single point. Okay. Great. Okay, so here's my whole setup. Uh, what's the rest of the talk? Um, it's uh, it's a rigidity theorem for all the other geometric examples on the circle. So, rigidity of all other oh, geometric actions on the circle. Let me tell you what the, all the other geometric examples are. So here's a fact slash exercise. Okay. Um, if G, so I need, what do I need in this definition? I need to tell you I'm gamma, I want to put it into homeomorphisms of the circle, but it's supposed to factor through some Lie group. What are the options for the Lie group? Let's be systematic. Okay. If G uh, acts on the circle um, uh, transitively, Then uh, there's not very many options. G is either, I already gave you PSL2R as an example. Uh, there's the obvious example of just rotations. Um, and then there's one more silly thing you can do, which is that uh, the circle is a cover of itself. So I could lift the action of PSL2R to that cover, and I'll get uh, all the other lifts will just be some central extension of PSL2R by the finite deck group. Okay? So, or there is a extension of PSL2R by some finite cyclic group, a central extension, okay, in which G sits. <coughs> Okay. And if this is acting by Mobius transformations on this little circle, this is acting on the k-fold cover. Okay. So it's just the group of all the lifts. Okay. This is a fun thing to try and prove. Uh, uh, what's the key here is that this, the circle is not very big. A Lie group inside uh, of its group of homeomorphisms uh, can be at most three-dimensional. Okay, so these are all the geometric examples and lattices in these. Well, this one's already compact. Uh, here you have surface groups. And here you can have either surface groups or things that are virtually surface groups. So the fundamental groups of surfaces, of genus G at least two, are the only candidates here. And the theorem, okay, uh, one direction, uh, uh, was uh, work for my thesis in 2014. And the other direction is with Maxime Wolf from last year. Okay. Okay. It's the statement that uh, actions of surface groups on the circle Uh, whoop, not R. An action uh, of a surface group on the circle is rigid, namely an isolated point in this character space, if and only if it's one of the examples I just gave you, it's geometric. So secretly there's a Lie group there 
could look like Matsumoto's example. It could be one of these uh, central extensions. And those are exactly the ones that have no non-trivial deformations. Oh, <laughs> and of course, these arrows now make no sense. OK. So the easy direction was the earlier one. Uh, geometric implies rigid. Here you have specific constructions. I give you a surface group sitting in here. I know what its action is. I can write down matrices if you like, whatever. Uh, you want to prove that there's no interesting deformations of this. So this is something you start attacking by hand and saying, well, if I you know, you know, systematically try to do these things, uh, nothing can happen. Uh, there's a bunch of machinery to do this. Okay. And this is the truly remarkable example that that's an example. You know, at that point, I conjectured out of optimism that I had found all the rigid examples because I tried to find more and I couldn't. Uh, you know, brute force conjecture by lack of creativity. Um, this direction is how, well, how does this go? Someone hands you a mystery representation about which you know nothing. You just have some group action. Okay, oh, but you do know one thing. If you tried to change it, you would fail. From that, you're supposed to recover uh, a Lie group and in which your surface group happens to sit as a lattice. Okay. Okay. So this is the direction that we're going to be talking about um, that required an invention of a bunch of techniques for dealing with these things. Questions so far? Okay. Let me make a little remark. It's really, really easy to produce lots of non rigid, non geometric examples. Okay? So, home, gamma, home EOS, so I'll even say. Actions of, uh, I'll say, surface groups for concreteness. This space is big. In fact, even this uh, character space it's big and it's kind of wild. Um, uh, It's easy to make lots of non-geometric examples. Okay. For instance, uh, maybe you like uh, working with representations of surface groups into PSL2R. That's a thing people like a lot. If you uh, take one of those that doesn't come from a hyperbolic structure on your surface, um, then uh, uh, it's not rigid, even in the PSL2R character variety or, or deformation space. So um, it, it, it follows from work of Bill Goldman that the non teichmuller examples uh, uh, have a large deformation space. And in particular, you'll find elements that act by rotations. And as you perturb this, you can change the amount they rotate. And that's a conjugacy invariant, even or an, even a semi-conjugacy invariant uh, in the group of homeomorphisms of the circle. So even if you just work within representations to PSL2R, you don't find any other candidates for things that might be uh, rigid by topological conjugacy. Okay. So even uh, perhaps with image in PSL2R. Ah, lots of this. Lots of these. And if you want to go outside of, I know how to write down matrices and do these things, uh, here's another good way to make lots of crazy examples. OK, so I guess one, you could take representations in the PSL2R. 
or two, here's my favorite strategy. Uh, take your surface, think of it geometrically, cut it in half somewhere, and uh, this uh, lets me think of my surface by what, Van Kampen? I can think of the fundamental group as an amalgamated free product of the fundamental group of this part and that part. Okay, but these are just both free groups. So this lets me write my fundamental group as a, a free group. Um, that's, well, free group on, here I've done it as, let's write it properly, that's a free group on two generators. Uh, this one on four, I guess, and it's amalgamated over the cyclic subgroup generated by this curve. Okay. So what is this saying? Free groups, that's easy. Just uh, uh, take any two homomorphisms of the circle. There's no relations to satisfy. To any two homeomorphisms of the circle can be the generators of this group. Similarly, pick whatever you want here, and you're subject to a single constraint that the action of this group and the action of that group agree on this common element. Okay. But that gives you lots of room for variation to make this one do like whatever you want, and now just cook up the other side uh, so that uh, product of commutators that gives this curve agrees. Okay. So free groups are easy to make, act, and deform. interesting here that, so I want to start sort of warming up towards some ideas of the proof. Uh, and one thing that I, you know, I sort of, I didn't realize until afterwards, and uh, when I went back and read Matsumoto's proof again, is that there's ideas in here, sort of well under the surface, that parallel uh, uh, some global strategy of what we did in here. So let me tell you one of these very important tools. So. Uh, a key tool, which is also another kind of beautiful analogy uh, between the linear case and the surface group case, um, and uh, in fact is part of how you see that representations up to semi-conjugacy is a Hausdorff space in a reasonable corrosion. Um, it's a following theorem, which is due uh, to Gis, uh, and rephrased uh, in the way I'm going to state it uh, by Matsumoto. Okay. And it says that uh, there are coordinates, there are natural coordinates on the space of actions of any group on the circle up to semi-conjugacy. Okay. Um, analogous to uh, characters or trace coordinates of uh, representations into SLNC. Okay. So uh, taking SL2C to be concrete, if you uh, have a representation of a group into there and you know the trace of everyone uh, theorem, you know the, well, I mean, you know the representation up to conjugacy unless it was upper triangular, basically. Okay. This space has the uh, same kind of thing. So what's, what's the analog of character? I should have some conjugacy invariant function. Um, this is given by 
uh, the only dynamical invariant, really, of circle homeomorphisms, uh, the Poincaré rotation number. Okay, so if you haven't seen this definition before, this is to any homeomorphism, you assign a number in R mod Z, that, or in S1 if you like, that captures the average amount, it rotates points. Okay. And uh, the theorem here is stated very imprecisely, uh, slightly more precisely, it is that um, uh, a representation from any group you like into the group of homeomorphisms of the circle is determined essentially so there's some finite ambiguity there but uh, nothing that we need to uh, worry about for the proof by uh, the rotation numbers of each curve gamma in gamma. Okay. And maybe it's worthwhile to say what I, when I meet by, my, by essentially, there's slightly more information that you need. Okay. So here's really what's going on. Uh, let's take my favorite group, uh, my, my favorite representation, the one that gives you a surface group in PSL2R, the Fuchsian action, the, the nice boundary one. There, we know the dynamics of things. Every element of my group acts as a hyperbolic transformation, has two fixed points, okay, and has source sync dynamics. Okay. <coughs> having a fixed point is equivalent to having rotation number zero. So this representation gets assigned zero for everybody. Okay. Um, it is highly non-trivial, but unfortunately the trivial representation also gets assigned zero for everybody. Um, so that's what essentially is saying. It said I was not being precise enough. Okay. What's the difference? It's determined actually by, uh, so it's determined up to semi-conjugacy by the rotation numbers of not single elements, okay, but comparing pairs. Okay. Okay. So what you need to know is the function uh, that takes two elements and counts uh, the, how their product wraps around the circle. So in PSL2R, if I have two things, uh, maybe someone with an axis like this, and then someone else with an axis like this in very strong dynamics, and I take their composition, um, the composition will quite likely if I start with some point here, this guy, the blue guy will move it all the way over here, and then the black one will move it back to where it started. It will have a fixed point, but one where if you track uh, uh, how it winds around the circle, it will have made a full rotation. Okay, that's somehow different than the trivial representation where everyone's the identity and the point doesn't move ever. Okay, okay. so this is given, uh, by lifting these, so I want to track how much something winds around the circle. Okay. This function is given by uh, <coughs> taking an element, lifting it to a homeomorphism of the line, that commutes with, I'm thinking of the line here as a universal cover of the circle, so I'll lift it up to, if I, my circle is R mod Z, this will be something that commutes with the deck group, acting by translations. So it is Z equivariant homeomorphisms of R. Okay. I can take a lift of the other one. Okay. I can look at the average amount these translate points. So if I took their lifts with fixed points, I would get zero and zero. 
And I want to compare this to how uh, the product does. So in the cartoon I just pointed at, um, this is exactly capturing the fact that this product winds you around the circle once. I lifted to the universal cover so I could keep track of my movement back and forth. Okay. Okay. So this is what you need to keep track of, really, that distinguishes uh, the trivial representation from this Fuchsian guy. But it's framed completely in terms of uh, essentially of rotation or translation numbers of elements. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Uh, one question I want to point out now before I go on uh, is that I would very much like to know uh, an analogy of this theorem if you increase the regularity here. So instead of homeomorphisms up to semi-conjugacy, let's study actions of a group by diffeomorphism, C1 even, on the circle. Okay. And I can think of those up to C1 conjugacy. And that space, I'm sure, is not Hausdorff and is nasty and terrible, although I haven't quantified how bad it could be. Um, but we can say, OK, pass to the largest Hausdorff quotient. What is that? I, and if you like smooth, replace C1 with smooth. Um, I know no nice uh, analog uh, of this in the higher regularity, but it's uh, mostly because I haven't tried. Um, or who knows, maybe it's reasonable to say, or maybe it's extremely difficult. I think it's a, it's a fascinating question. OK, so what does this all boil down to? It means that both us and Matsumoto are um, uh, trying to understand deformations of representations by understanding how much curves rotate points around the circle. We're trying to, we're looking, we know things are non-conjugate. Basically, as soon as this number changes for some pair of gamma 1, gamma 2. So I wanted to give the technical correct one, but you should think of this as being sufficient to just know rotation numbers of individual elements. If you're working locally, that's good enough to recover this. The point is the bad example I gave of the trivial thing and this Fuchsian thing are extremely far apart from each <coughs> other. Um, so working locally, you just, need to, you just need to understand rotation numbers of elements. So let me give you the two-step outline of what we do, and maybe a cartoon of one of the steps, um, and then leave it to uh, Maxime tomorrow to go into more detail. So here's an outline, a very broad outline. of the proof of uh, rigid implies geometric for surface group actions. Get some more space here. All right. Um, so the first thing we noticed is that this theorem would be a lot easier to prove. If instead of just knowing something was rigid, we knew we could make arguments like this, we knew that all the elements looked like they had source sync dynamics or were secretly living in PSL2R or something like this. 
Um, I was surprised very recently that going back to reading of Matsumoto's original paper of uh, Fuxing example is rigid, he actually spends two pages being like, let's pretend the image was just in PSL2R because that'll make my argument easier. Um, and then he's using sources and sinks of hyperbolic elements and gets a nice conclusion and then goes back and says like, well, you can't expect this in general at all, but we'll try and do some deformations and say that this argument kind of sort of can be pushed through and five pages later of like technical misery uh, nails it. Um, uh, independently, we had the same idea. Wow, if this was kind of looking like everything was just sort of nice hyperbolic dynamics uh, in this topological sense, uh, we could almost do that. So uh, then came the hard work of reducing to this case. So part one is to say that uh, suppose that rho uh, is rigid. Okay. Then uh, we can conclude that uh, after semi-conjugacy, I can well after after semi-conjugacy, I can always pass to a minimal action, one where all orbits are dense. So I'll add rigid uh, and minimal to kind of pick out my preferred semi-conjugacy class. I won't blow up anything I don't need to. Okay. Then, and this is the hard part, this is sort of the bulk of the work. Okay. Um, individual elements look like they sit inside of one of these Lie groups. Okay. Okay. So then very locally, we look kind of geometric. There's a local geometric-ish picture. Precisely if uh, you take two curves on your surface, two, two elements of the fundamental group represented by simple closed curves um, that have intersection number one. So if I have A and B are curves, here's maybe A. Here's B. So if up to some action of the mapping class group, I can draw my curves like this. OK. OK. Then here's the dynamics of uh, row A and row B. So um, then there exists some K, which is actually independent of row A. Uh, sorry, independent of A and B. So the same K works for all the curves on your surface. So that A and B each have two K fixed points. Uh, not necessarily fixed, periodic points. Okay. Uh, half of which are attracting, half of which are repelling. Um, maybe this is the attracting one and the other repelling. So alternating, attracting and repelling periodic points. Uh, and they also alternate in the surface. Okay. So this is exactly the dynamical picture of how periodic points look in one of these lifts from an action of PSL to R. Right, if you look at the geometric picture of this, that's k equals 1. This is, uh, these are two hyperbolic elements with crossed axes from the way we usually draw this picture. Okay, and if I, so there's a, an attractor, a repeller of this one, an attractor, a repeller, an attractor. If I lift this to a k-fold cover, and I take any of the lifts, these will become periodic points, alternating, attracting, and repelling. Okay, so here's the picture where k equals 2. Okay. 
So there's a local geometric picture. I say geometric-ish because all we know is the kind of combinatorics of attracting and repelling periodic points. Okay. So this really is the, the, the headache to go from nothing to ah, a nice combinatorial picture. Okay. Step two is to just do a combinatorial argument and recover your surface. Okay. So step two is a local to global argument. Okay. So this is a statement that if rho is rigid and satisfies uh, the local picture on pairs of simple closed curves uh, given by one, okay, then uh, rho is in fact geometric. Um, and the idea of this is just to use very specific deformations okay. is um, here we use very specific deformations analogous uh, to bending or doing an earthquake uh, from Teichmuller theory, but really we're just, you're, instead of a lamination, we use a one single simple closed curve. Okay, so it's almost as if you, you're putting a Dane twist around the curve in a one parameter family. So bending from, say, the theory of Kleining and groups, you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, to say that if you're not in exactly the right configuration, all your curves, so here's something only on pairs, but I really want to recover my entire surface, okay? Um, to reconstruct uh, the combinatorial configuration. of all curves, all simple closed curves, on the surface. Okay. So my hypothesis says that like some pairs look good. Um, and now I want to say, well, like, no, but now I have a curve over here that's disjoint, maybe this one. In the geometric picture, it's supposed to have an axis that's disjoint. So in the lift, I'm supposed to see, what if I see green attractor? Then before I see the red repeller, I should see two points here, plus and minus. And then, uh, oh, I have to go around a whole time. And then I should see the other two lifts of this, plus and minus there. Um, that's something that this hypothesis doesn't give me. And we have to recover this kind of information, okay? And we do this by producing, should this not be true, if this plus was actually somewhere over here, um, goodness forbid, uh, we write down a specific deformation that moves it somewhere else, giving us the wrong combinatorics or the wrong rotation numbers for pairs of elements. And say, oh wait, but uh, it was rigid, that could not have happened, okay? So the whole idea of here is to use specific deformations to say you had to be in the right combinatorial configuration. And once you know that the attractors and repellers of all your simple closed curves are in the right place, it's not so bad after that to say your surface group had to be acting as it was in the geometric picture. Okay. 
But I have run out of time. Um, and so hopefully that has given us kind of a starting point for which, or an advertisement for Maxime's talk tomorrow. Um, so I'll conclude with that. Yeah. Uh, like non-surface groups. Uh, so I, there's, there's, there's two ways I know to produce examples. Okay, so one is uh, if you have finite order elements, that will help you because, uh, well, if you're finite order, you're conjugate to a rotation. So you can play with this and do some things. So things like uh, even SL2Z, free product of Z2 and Z mod 3Z, is known to be rigid for an argument like that. Um, I forget, I should cite who, I think Michele Triestino and friends have written this down recently. I've, uh, in some work that they've been doing. But I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get the wrong people attached to the wrong theorems. Another thing you can do is you could take um, a hyperbolic three manifold group from a three manifold that fibers over the circle and take the example, this, this sort of, there's a nice geometric action uh, of this group on the circle where the surface fiber subgroup is in PSL2R. And because the rest of your fundamental group normalizes this, then that forces that action to be rigid. So you can do sort of tricks like this. Uh, I don't know, uh, so a uh, question I would like to answer is that's an example of Thurston's universal circle construction. To what extent are the, uh, but, uh, but that's a very general construction that applies to a wider class of examples. Are these all rigid? What do they look like if not? Um, so it's trickier because uh, you have some choices in the construction more generally. Um, uh, so I think that's good. That's a good, that's a good long-term project. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you use? In which parts of the proof do you use these, these coordinates? Yeah, so this is going, so first, first, well, it's here everywhere. So first, I, the conclusion of this is that everything has a periodic orbit of period 2K. So first thing we have to show is that the rotation number of a simple closed curve is, is rational. And then that they're all the, have the same denominator. Um, and that's done by, again, producing an explicit deformation. We're saying, oh, if it was irrational, then I can do a particular thing and change its rotation number. Oops, not rigid. Uh, so, so, so it must have been rational. So that's actually like lemma zero, is that all simple closed curves have rational rotation number. And then we want to put their, their, their put orbits in a good configuration. And that's Maxime's talk, definitely. So. <coughs> um. Any more questions? So otherwise let's then get